Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. This is, of course, where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndoro and that's, this is what's coming up on the show. We'll be unpacking a recent report by an independent panel on the ethics and credibility of South Africa's news media. A new study has also revealed that one third of all African stories and news outlets on the continent are sourced from foreign news services. Uh, find out a little bit more about that in the show later. And in our news and history feature this week, we take you back to the year 2000. Find out uh, why and what was interesting about that year. Remember, you can also engage with us on social media using our Twitter handle, uh, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. And you can also share your views uh, on WhatsApp, and the number is 065 862 4548. That's 065 862 4548. Now, before we get into our highlighted stories on the program, let's first take a look at what's on the front pages of our Sunday newspapers this morning. The Sunday Times, well, that paper's reporting that the Democratic Alliance leader John Steenhuisen has said that they would block any attempt of a no-confidence vote in President Cyril Ramaphosa. The DA leader said that uh, it's, it seems that the DA leader may be opening the door for a possible coalition uh, with the ANC should there be a stalemate in the 2024 elections. The City Press uh, lead story says the Special Investigating Unit is probing the two billion rand ESCOM fraud that uh, has taken place. Apparently crooks allegedly funneled large sums of money from the utility using small fraudulent transactions, possibly with inside help. Apparently money was milked from the power utility in the past three years in a scheme that allegedly involved ghost suppliers and well-placed company officials. And that's according to a preliminary uh, forensics report. The Sunday Independent headline reads, Don't use us as guinea pigs. Yeah, this refers to concerns raised by the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority board members that are outraged that government has announced a rollout of Johnson & Johnson vaccines when in fact it's just another clinical trial by the American pharmaceutical company. Board chairpersons has asked in their WhatsApp group uh, why Johnson & Johnson phase 3B clinical trial is being called a rollout. The Sunday Tribune is uh, leading with a story about uh, two COVID-19 vaccines that are being refined in the country that have the potential of outstanding current and future variants of the coronavirus. Shantivax and HAD5 are being seen as uh, the next generation vaccines. The Weekend Argus on Sunday is also running the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, being touted as a rollout when it seems it might be just another clinical trial by the American pharmaceutical com company. The other story there on the front page is uh, about the killing of top cop Detective Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear, where new information appears to have emerged. The paper is reporting that contents of a report with the signature of Divisional uh, Commissioner uh, Moikedzi Siepe was never shared with top officials. This after uh, Siepe was uh, tasked to investigate events that led to Kinnear's death and murder. The Sunday World is leading with a story about uh, former Minister Batabile Dlamini's famous statement small nana skeletons in the closet. Well, the paper is reporting that uh, former minister and uh, her spokesperson owe over 3.4 million rand. And this is for monies paid to a private security firm for their children's security. Uh, Sasa apparently is in uh, a court to try and recover those monies. All right, let's uh, now take a look at uh, some of the trending topics on social media this morning. 
And so this is uh, what's uh, on trending. Let's take a look at the list. And that list there, uh, quite a number of interesting ones, a lot of them uh, to do with foreign ones. But the one that works for me is this one, number five, Zabelo Shabisa. And uh, what that is about is uh, this young lady has uh, been chosen to represent South Africa. Uh, she's from uh, uh, KZN and she's now at the fifth stage uh, in Egypt uh, it, uh, uh, to represent South Africa in the top model competition. And uh, as you can see, people who know her have been posting saying that it all started in 2018. Uh, her name is Zabelo Tlabisa and uh, they're asking for people to retweet so that South Africa know that she's in the final of the top model competition. And this is her representing South Africa, doing us proud on the 5th of March. Uh, we're raising support for this local board who's representing us. And uh, yeah, Ayanda says she deserves to win and represent us well in Egypt. So this is a young lady in South Africa who's uh, representing us on a world stage. And uh, let's hope that uh, she uh, does do us proud. And uh, we hope, we're keeping our fingers crossed, that she raises the flag uh, and as Zikona says, so there she is, Top Model Africa 2021. She's in the fifth stage. Now, the South African National Editors Forum recently released an independent panel report they'd commissioned inquiring into media ethics and credibility. Headed by retired Judge Kathleen Satchwell with Commissioners Nigiwe Bikicha and Richem Kondo, the 329-page report describes a media industry that's in trouble. Taking input from 167 contributors and more than 100 documents, the inquiry paints a picture of South African media in distress. I spoke to the executive director of SANEF, Kate Fisher, about the report, and I began by asking her why the inquiry was commissioned. So there were a lot of things happening. Um, you know, ethics is a big issue for SANEF, um, and um, you know, so it was certainly it was important to to kind of look at ethics to have a pause moment to look at that. But then there were also a couple of things that happened um, in terms of you know stories from the Sunday Times around the rogue unit, um, the Zimbabwe rendition story, the Cato Manor story, um, and it, you know we thought that actually it's important. These stories are that important uh, that. If there's something that's gone wrong um, editorially, uh, let's have a look at it. But, but right from the get-go, there was a sense of, you know, the Sunday Times is one publication, uh, but there are ethics issues not only there, but across the entire industry. So it, it was the trigger, but always with the sense of the fact that we have to look at the entire industry and ethics issues across the industry. Um, so, yeah, and a brilliant pause moment to, to look at those issues and look at them in their complexity and their breadth and their depth. So you mentioned a, a couple of cases um, and any inquiry is at a particular moment in time. We know that significant things have happened since uh, the report, uh, but does it, did it find things of a, I don't know, systemic nature that have happened over a period of time that talks more about the state rather than events? Yes. Good question. So, so yes, I mean, we looked at the, well, the panelists looked at the issue of the fact that um, the industry is under huge financial pressure. Um, and the fact that it's under such huge financial pressure means that ethics issues do, do in fact, get undermined. Um, uh, and so, you know, those systematic issues were picked up on and, and dealt with, with with a lot of recommendations around them. The other thing that we looked at, um, you know, as Senate, and in our submissions, and of course the panelists looked in detail, was, was the regulatory bodies. You know, is the press council doing a, uh, um, a, a good job? In what way is it doing a good job? In what ways could it be strengthened? The Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa, you know, so, so those regulatory issues. And then also um, issues around, you know, what is happening to journalism right now? What is happening with 
you know, um, misinformation, disinformation, what is happening with, with the speed at which people are operating. So, so the issues of the 24-hour news cycle, the impact of social media. So, so all of those were kind of systematic issues that, that um, the panel looked at in, in detail. And we also talked about in, in, in our submission to, to the commission. So how did they go about their work? Um, I wouldn't think that uh, this is like the Zondo Commission by any stretch of the imagination. No. Um, so, so it was interesting. So at the beginning, I think they, you know, the panelists thought that this was going to be a pretty quick job, you know, done, done in, in, in about six months, maybe, maybe a bit longer than that, um, you know, and then they would have a report, maybe about 100 pages, you know, people would make submissions, they would contact um, certain, you know, journalists forwards, um, you know, experts in the field. Um, and I think it did turn out to be something quite a bit bigger, um, because, it, you know, we only, it, it was launched in 20 19, and in fact, in 2021, um, finally the report was done. They did introduce, they did interview a lot of people. I mean, they literally, it was interesting talking to, um, uh, you know, Judge Kathy Satchel. I mean, she said she got thesis book, you know, length submissions. Um, you know, so I think it did become a lot bigger than, than originally imagined. And I mean, the final report is well over 300 pages. So it was literally three times what, what um, you know, a, a Judge Satchel had, had imagined it would be in the first place. Describe the voices that were heard then in the end that sort of informed the state of play. Yeah, a real variety of people. So, so I, I mean, a number of disgruntled members of the general public, you know, complaining about how they really disliked the media and how, you know, that they there were particular stories that they felt were inappropriate, uh, particular people that felt that they had been defamed by the media and were very upset about it. Um, and then a series of kind of academics, um, you know, journalists that have been in the, um, you know, in the field for a very long time. Um, um, yeah, so, so academics, experts, uh, journalists, members of the public, a real variety of different people. So um, I know that uh, a good number of recommendations came out of this, uh, but before we get to the recommendations, is the industry in distress? Is this what's come out of this report? Yes. I think I think what's come out of the report quite clearly is that the, the industry is in distress. It's in distress, you know, for all of those different reasons, you know, the finances, the misinformation, disinformation, all, all, all of those, those, those different, different issues. Um, and so, yes, the recommendations, I mean, a lot, there's 69 recommendations looking at all those different areas and what needs to, to be done about it. But I do think that that was, was an interesting one, um, you know, but, but basically the panelists said, you know, we're worried. Something needs to be done. This, this is not an industry where, where people, individuals, journalists themselves are particularly happy. They, they are under a lot of stress themselves. So there, was, there were a lot of personal stories, I think, that came out as well, which I think was interesting, just to get a sense of the level of the stress for, for a number of people. So take us through some of the things that uh, perhaps, you know, broadly speaking, uh, need to be done and need to be done uh, straight away to try and bring us back uh, from, you know, uh, uh, the emergency room. Yeah. So, so a lot, and I mean, it's a great variety of different ones. So, so some of them would be looking at like media freedom issues, um, saying that government um, and the corporate sector needs to, um, you know, come out um, and in support of the media and and talk to the importance of of a strong media sector and give support in terms of financial support. Um, so there were issues of looking, for instance, at the setting up of the media sustainability fund. Um, you know, then there were were a lot of issues around strengthening the press council, strengthening the BCCSA, uh, making those institutions a lot more accessible. Um, quite some interesting things around the fact that the media itself is not necessarily as diverse as it should be, and that that sometimes you know impacts uh, impacts on its ethics. So some really interesting things around how to uh, gauge 
diversity issues, um, looking at audiences and what audiences actually get in terms of the media that they, they consume. Um, and then some very interesting issues around just ethical practice in the newsrooms, like, you know, for instance, a lot more transparency around where do media houses get their money um, and individual journalists, what is your background? Because you've got this one of the interesting things that came out, revolving door. You might be a government spokesperson. You might be, um, you know, working in the PR industry. Then you're back into the media sector. Then you're back into the PR industry. Who are you? What's your background? If you were working as an ESCON spokesperson, for instance, you know, you come back as a journalist, you, you, you couldn't, for instance, then be talking about ESCOM um, because, you, 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 you know, there'd be a, per a perception that you would be biased. So, uh, you know, some very interesting issues around, around, around transparency um, and bringing the general public into the understanding of how journalism works, who are these journalists, what is their background, and, um, yeah, things to think about and look at. But we, you know, we, we have an industry that's... Uh been around for centuries. And a lot of what you're saying, we should have known um, and we should have been practicing. So did we stop knowing or because of pressure, we consciously ignored and consciously made other choices because I can't believe that we didn't know. I think we've always known we have a, a way of doing things, but probably we chose not to. Yes. So I think I think the thing that it, it, that comes out very strongly is that this is an industry under pressure. So yes, some some of it is just negligence, and um, you know you know maybe people um, forgetting some of the basics around journalism. But I think the big story and the more important one is just the level of pressure that people are under. Um, and that's not to let ourselves off the hook. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be as ethical as we possibly can be and that we shouldn't go back to 101 of journalism. But I do think what is important is it just says, you know, particularly the financial issues, the speed, um, you know, the disinformation, misinformation, the impact of social media, that these are some of the pressures that journalists are working under. And that is why, um, you know, mistakes have been made. Um, so it gives uh, people a background as to why these kind of things are happening. Uh, but, but it isn't saying that it's letting people off the hook and saying, okay, well, you know, the situation's really bad, so it's okay. Not at all. But to say, but these are some of the pressures. There are basics like checks and balances. Somebody checks a sub-editor, goes to an editor, somebody signs off. Do, do, do you get a sense that perhaps because the newsroom is shrinking, and uh, also maybe that experience isn't there in, in, in all of the people sitting in the editor's chair, that things were slipping, more and more things were slipping through. Yeah, I think that that's a very important point, the point of the shrinking newsrooms, because you literally don't have the sub-editors that you used to have. You don't have the beat reporters, you know, who, who cover the courts day after day, year after year. Um, you've got people covering huge numbers of different areas. Um, you do have a lot of young people coming in, which is wonderful, but that experience of, 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 of the older generation that had been there, um, you know, and knew the ropes, um, you know, a lot of those people have gone because they're expensive. So I think I think those those are some of the key key issues. And one of the biggest is just the number of journalists that are in the newsroom. So how do we fix it? You've got the recommendations, but who puts them into practice? I mean, who yeah. who gets the job done? Well, look, I mean, you know, that, that is that is what we, you know, as SANIF need to do moving forward is to put together an ethics plan, which is a very concrete plan with timelines, with who does it, when, as I said, timelines, um, you know, and also talking to the issues of money that is required for those various um, recommendations to you to be put together. But, but it starts with an ethics plan that will, in fact, be adopted at an ethics conference uh, with all the key players there. Um, so, yeah, it can't be left to chance. Nothing will happen if, 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 if it is just left to chance. It's got to be adopted by the main players with a sense of it being a five-year plan, which needs to be adopted over time with you know, some of the low-hanging fruit being um, sorted first. All right, and uh, perhaps as a final question, nothing to do with this actual report, but I think quite a significant uh, shift maybe 
uh, the ruling in Australia that the likes of Facebook need to pay media houses for their content. This would go a long way to help deal with uh, some of this financial pressure drama, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I think it is really, really important um, and absolutely critical to the ethics report um, and a global shift which is completely in the right direction. That was uh, Kate Skinner speaking to me uh, about the uh, media ethics report that was uh, released uh, by SANEF. It was commissioned by them, but uh, run by an independent panel, which was led by retired judge uh, uh, Kathleen Satchwell. And it paints a pretty grim picture, but now we know what the problem is, uh, we can do something about it. We'll be monitoring uh, progress there uh, via the South African National Editors Forum. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll explore an interesting story um, that most, a lot of our news on, on the continent actually comes from foreign sources. Find out why and what it means. All of that's still to come. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. Now, it may surprise you to know that about a third of all African stories in news outlets on the continent are sourced from foreign news services. Yeah, that's according to a new report from Africa No Filter, and that's a donor-funded collective that's working to shift stereotypical narratives about and within Africa. Now, their report, How African Media Covers Africa, highlights the fact that these stories about Africa continue to be told through the same persistent and negative stereotypes. For the report, the uh, media selected and reviewed from 15 countries with the editors of these publications surveyed for their opinions on how African countries cover other African countries. The publications were drawn from all regions, North, Southern, West and Central and East Africa. And in total, 56 media uh, outlets were included in these components of the study. The most influential media in each country were selected. Now, the review found that uh, the coverage of African countries was poor in terms of overall numbers. Now, why this issue is important well, the report says that coverage of African countries in African media not only serves to inform readers about what's happening on the continent, but may also shape perspectives about the continent and the countries therein. Well, to help us unpack this story, I'm now joined by seasoned journalist Paula Frey, who's the CEO of Frey Intermedia in South Africa. And uh, from Ivory Coast, we have news correspondent Liane de Bassompierre. Uh, ladies, uh, very good morning to both of you. Welcome to the program. Uh, perhaps let me start with you, Paula, and just ask you, um, I suppose this doesn't come as a surprise that a third of our news sources come from foreign news services about Africa. Yeah. So to be clear, Peter, the research <clears throat> was looking at how Africa covers Africa. And so it was really looking at how media on the continent um, actually covered countries, other countries um, and beyond the country in which they were based. Um, and, and we found that, that in most of the stories that we were actually using were stories that were coming from wire services like AFP, BBC or Reuters. And that wire services and free content were actually the key sources. So I'm to some degree, I'm not surprised. I used to um, be head up Interpress Service in Africa, and, and we know that we were relied on by organizations across the continent in order to supply news on Africa. All right, Leanne, uh, I just wonder what your thoughts are, because you're a journalist, and uh, we often, and like here as well, have to rely on news services like Reuters, Agence France Press, etc to get stories about what's happening else on the continent. Is that something that you experience working in Abidjan uh, mostly? Well, Peter, I actually find that that number is quite low. I thought it would be at least half because in my experience mm. working in a newsroom in, in South Africa and now working across West Africa, uh, we really do rely a lot on these foreign news services. Um, I work for, for several um, from based from here. Uh, but I'm finding that more and more these uh, foreign news services are using more and more local correspondence. So there is some degree of 
locals telling their own stories through these news agencies. So I think that there is some degree of them trying to more and more filter through their stories um, through the rest of the continent. Mm. A question for both of you. Let me start with you, Paula. Then, um, do you think that we are telling other African stories enough? In other words, I'm sitting here in South Africa, I'm an editor, I've got a paper. Are we telling stories about Guinea-Bissau, about Cape Verde, about Chautomé mm. and Principe, for example? And so, so, you know, Peter, I mean, if, if you go back to the research, for example, I mean, one of the things that we found was that the coverage of the continent was also very skewed in the sense that there was a lot of coverage about elections, about politics. But the fullness of our lives, the fact that we are people that we have interests in arts, culture, um, you know, just general lifestyle stories are missing in the coverage of one another. So, so we don't First of all, we don't report enough about the rest of the continent. And then when we do report about it, it's very, very specific in, in the kind of content. It's very hard news. It's very political. Mm. Um, and when it's about economics, it's always quite, it, it, it seems to, to, to favor the World Bank, <clears throat> the AU, et cetera. Um, and so, so, so the long answer to your question is mm. not enough coverage. And even when we have coverage, um, not enough about the fullness of our lives, of the nuances of what it's like to be Africa, African living in Africa. And uh, Leanne, is, is West Africa similar? Well, I agree with Paula that the, that the coverage we have across uh, different African countries, it's really just about politics. Uh, it's really just around elections. Um, it's not about the day-to-day -day life. And also, you don't really find stories about, you know, interactions between, you know, I'm based in Ivory Coast now, but interactions between Ivory Coast and South Africa or interactions between West Africa and East Africa. There will always be stories around, you know, coverage around the African Union or, um, you know, bigger countries on the continent like Nigeria. So smaller countries where there aren't perhaps correspondents. I know some of the, even the big news agencies don't have anyone in Guinea-Bissau or Sao Tome or these smaller places. And there's a lot to be told from these, um, these smaller West African nations. Guinea-Bissau, for example, is coming, you know, or not becoming in the last couple of years, it's really become a transit point for drugs from Latin America to Guinea-Bissau to Europe. Mm. So there are stories that need to be told and it's just not getting out mm. there, you know, enough. But I find that in West Africa, compared to when I lived in South Africa, when I was covering news, locally, there's a lot of news that you find in local newspapers from the region. So mm -hmm. from Burkina, from Mali, from Nigeria, um, not necessarily from you know, East or Southern Africa, but definitely from, from the region, which I found quite uh, inspiring mm -hmm. that not just it won't just be political stories about the late, mm -hmm. all the latest terrorism uh, acts, uh, but it will be kind of local stories from these places about you know, a young entrepreneur mm -hmm. who's, uh, you know, producing chocolate or the author stories that are coming through um, at least in, in, in local newspapers and on, on television locally. Leanne, do you, mm. do you find that there's a difference if the country is francophone or anglophone that uh, stories perhaps get missed if it's uh, uh, if an English newspaper perhaps doesn't always cover francophone countries or is the region quite equal in the way that it deals with uh, 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 the countries? Um, absolutely. Um, news coming through from, even though Ghana is just next to Ivory Coast and they've got a lot in common, they're the world's number one and number two uh, cocoa producers, they should have a lot more interaction, a lot more uh, relations between the two countries. But you very seldom have news from Ghana in Ivory Coast if it's not cocoa related. Um, so I think that there is already just, I mean, it's a 40 minute flight, it's four hours to the border. Uh, there's already that divide between, you know, Anglophone country and Francophone country, whereas you get a lot more news from Mali or Burkina or Senegal, which is much further away. Um, same as I said, from news from East Africa or Southern Africa, it will have to be something, you know, very big for it to make uh, local papers here. Uh, so there definitely is that divide. Also the stories that they pick up, um, the organizations that they use, I find that if it's a big uh, francophone organization that's made an announcement on something, you know, it will come out very quickly. But for example, 
uh, there was a, a, an Anglophone organization that released a report on, on, on something recently, and it was only picked up by local media, mm-hmm. you know, days later, whereas in, in Anglophone media, I'd already seen it, uh, you know, immediately. So I think that there is that divide, and it's, it's still difficult um, for Francophone countries to pick up stories from Anglophone news wires and, and run with it. You know, mm-hmm. obviously, it, it takes a lot more manpower to translate, to etc. So there is that uh, degree of different languages, other re- other languages in this region, you know, Portuguese and Spanish, and uh, yeah, so it, it, it does add to, to the kind of coverage that you're giving. All right. So, um, Paula, why do you think this is? Is it that the readers are not interested in what's happening in other parts of the continent, or is it that the editors are too inward-looking? What, what's going wrong? So, you know, the, um, um, we really found that there were a couple of reasons that editors were citing. They were talking about a lack of funding, a lack of advertiser interest in Africa, a lack of space. I mean, in, in the focus groups, one of the comments that actually came out that was that, that sticks in my head repeatedly as something that we really need to overcome was the question of, you know, is Africa interested in Africa? Um, and I think it, it's a chicken egg situation that we have such poor coverage of, of, of the continent. Um, we sometimes have better coverage of what's happening in America in American elections than we do of the continent, that I think that, that, that there's a combination of a need to really go out there and tell our stories properly, um, and tell our stories in the fullness of our lives, um, and, and, and then also a need to, to, to really interest readers in the stories of, of, of the continent. What can be done, Paula? What, how do we change this? So I want to just say that that we also found incredible exemplars of really good coverage. You know, the elephant um, um, that, um, in, in, in Kenya, mm. the nation dot Africa's um, um, outreach to, to the rest of the continent. Um, even the Mail and Guardian's weekly publication, The Continent, is really kind of telling the stories that make a huge difference to the understanding of the continent. I know that Africa No Filter itself has huge plans in terms of changing the narrative on the continent, um, in terms of supporting um, writers on the continent, and I hope that they'll be able to talk more about that at some point. Um, but I do think that we need to create space to tell stories beyond politics, beyond hard news about about the African continent. And we as Africans need to challenge the tropes, not only that, that gets um, um, reported from foreign media, but we need to really be thinking about ourselves in terms of how are we covering mm-hmm. our own continent. Um, Leanne, uh, I would imagine everyone in each country is doing stories that are local. Is there an opportunity, do you think, for publications across the continent to work together to share stories and therefore we end up creating I suppose uh, a brotherhood which is, which would be similar to, almost to an, uh, a news agency. I definitely think there is scope to do that. Um, you find like um, news services like uh, Voice of America that use uh, local content from um, you know broadcasters in Kenya or Rwanda or elsewhere in in, in West Africa or Southern Africa. And I think what could, should happen is more conversations need to be had between media across these different local media, across these different continents, uh, uh, across the continent in these different countries, rather. Um, so, you know, an, an editor in Kenya reaching out to somebody in, in South Africa and saying, you know, this is our story, this is um, what we can offer for maybe just once a month or once a week, and what can you offer in return? So that already you know, answers the question about budget. Yes, people can't afford to be sending a, cor- a, a local newsroom in South Africa, can't necessarily be sending a correspondent to cover something elsewhere, but really creating connections between uh, media in these different countries. And as you said, creating a, an Africa-wide network, it doesn't have to be necessarily formalized, but creating a pool of, of reporters and reports and uh, starting conversations about the different kind of stories that you want to tell. Um, as you said earlier, a lot of the stories that are coming out is usually around elections. I remember, you know, uh, in the Ivory Coast elections last year, it was being, you know, the other media were just repeating what international media was saying. It was the narrative of, you know, the mm. country can be sent into chaos at any minute because Ouattara is uh, going for a third term. And so you find that other media will just repeat this narrative, repeat this narrative, because there's not enough people taking the time and making the effort to, to change the narrative or looking at different ways to tell the story of Ivory Coast, for example. 
Paula, mm. um, it, it can't be difficult. I mean, you know, we do have Pan-African journalist type organizations already in play. Um, editors belong to these kinds of things. Why do you think we haven't made those steps? So I think that one of the things that, that COVID, that the pandemic has actually done is, is, is really encourage media to be innovative in the way they actually approach their challenges or our challenges rather. And I mean, I, I don't want to say that there, there are um, um, limited, but, but there are already um, efforts um, that we're talking, um, similar to what we're talking about now. I mean, I think the Africa um, um, News Agency works on a similar model of, 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 of pulling in stories okay. and disseminating those stories to other media. Um, so we have already have that to do limited degree. I think that the big challenge is that we are in fact looking at smaller shrinking spaces. Mm. Um, and so media themselves are, are really having to make hard decisions about what they cover and they need to make editorial decisions about prioritizing African media. Um, I think part of the issue also, and we certainly found this when we were having editors discussions, is just having these discussions has been really useful in raising awareness about the opportunities and about the absence of the stories that we have. And, and I think sometimes the mere act of measuring something, how many stories are we covering about the rest of the continent, inspires us to actually do a better mm. job. And I think that's the challenge for African editors, you know. Uh, are we doing as good as a, job, a job as we should in covering yeah. our continent? We, we talked a, a little bit about story types, uh, Paula, and I just wonder <coughs> again... Um, I mean, for example, I was gobsmacked a few years ago when I found out that there are six countries in Africa that's, that have Portuguese as their main language, and that's more than anywhere else in the world. And yet, mm. I've never seen a story coming out of, um, apart from an election, Sao Tome and Principe, mm. I know nothing else. Uh, Cabo de mm -hmm. Verde, I know nothing else. So I just wonder, are we helping to perpetuate the stereotypes of the continent, uh, maybe even subconsciously, uh, if we are not bothering to tell different stories. I mean, I, I do agree with you on that. I, I think for me, the big issue, I mean, I, so I know Cabo Verde because of music, etc. But I think this reinforcing of, of Africa as being about poverty, about being conflict, about, you know, is often driven by the fact that the only stories we see from the rest of the continent are in fact stories when there are elections, or when there's an NSARS, or when there is some form of conflict, right? I mean, if, you, if we're talking about Portuguese countries, I mean, you're reading stories about Mozambique at the moment, probably because, um, um, because of conflict issues there. And, and so you're right, we give a very skewed vision of our continent when we keep on um, just reporting of, on these negatives. And, and this isn't an advocacy for sunshine journalism. This is advocacy to say that there is so much happening on the continent that is really displays the richness um, across the continent. And yet we don't know enough about West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa. I think Leanne is quite fortunate being in, a, in, 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 in West Africa, because if you look at media in West Africa and in East Africa particularly, you'll find a lot of stories about the region. You know, if I go to Kenya, I can read a lot of stories about the rest of, of East Africa. But very often that is limited in South Africa, that if you open our media, the coverage of of southern Africa is limited and the coverage of the rest of the continent is even more limited mm. unless we are covering NSARS or elections and I think that's the problem we give ourselves a skewed vision of ourselves mm. uh, Leanne as a correspondent in West Africa you'll get calls from international uh, news companies and they'll say we want to know more about this story Nine times out of ten, are they just a certain type of story that they're asking about? <laughs> um, definitely, <laughs> but the, the nice thing about actually working across different media is that if one news agency um, is not interested in a particular story or a particular angle, um, I could, you know, I often, I, I write for the continent's um, yeah. Mailing Guardians weekly publication, and I found specifically with them is that there is a lot of scope to tell different stories. Mm. Um, and Simon Addison, in particular, you know, he's been very good at finding 
local reporters in countries across the continent to tell stories and you know interesting stories uh, from there. So I find that 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 is quite nice from from where I'm sitting. But you're right, um, the, the scope is just about uh, elections, um, conflict, um, especially with Africa now the growing uh, terrorism threat. Um, that's coming you know, closer and closer to, to coastal areas. Uh, but there's a lot more that we should be telling. This region, for example, has really been affected by climate change, as is everywhere else. Um, what are people doing locally? Do they understand um, what this means for them? What, how do you place this into the context of the rest of the continent and the rest of the world? Um, there's also the thing where foreign news agencies um, will have a specific angle that they want to take. So even though you are doing the reporting on the ground, and I've had this with um, this conversation with a lot of locally based, uh, for, so locals that work for foreign mm. a- news agencies based here, saying, you know, we are on the ground, we are explaining what's happening here, but an editor in Johannesburg or in London or in New York wants to explain to us how the story should be treated um, based on what they think um, their audience wants to read. Mm. So I think that conversation is happening all the time. Um, So yes, it's great that you have a local person, you have a local stringer in these places, but actually listening uh, and let the story be driven from what they see and think uh, from the ground. You know, I, I, uh, on Friday, and this is uh, for you, uh, Leanne, as we start to wrap up, um, on Friday was an interesting day. Uh, in 1885, the Berlin Conference uh, signed off on how to divide Africa. I didn't see a single story about that anywhere, and yet the problems of today still stem from that which was signed off at that time. And I just wonder, is it that... Um, we could change things by the things that we write. We can change attitudes. We can change things like xenophobia if we wrote more about the continent and the things that we're about. Uh, and we'll probably find there's a lot more in common that we have uh, as a result. Absolutely. You know, four years ago, I also think that people, journalists, you know, are, are, we, we don't have enough time. We, we're not reading as broadly necessarily as what we should be. And so that also impacts on, you know, how we're going to, to you know, find stories, cover stories, treat stories. I mean, I'll give you, I use this example very often about, you know, just the, the disc- it's, a, it's a very extreme mm-hmm. example, but just the disconnect between, you know, West Africa and South Africa. When I was moving here four years ago, I said to, um, uh, it's actually a fellow journalist that I said this to, and I said, oh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm moving to Ivory Coast. And this person said, oh, the only thing I know about Ivory Coast is that the capital is Cote d'Ivoire. <laughs> and I, 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 was, <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, I mean, that, that is a very extreme example that I'm using, but just to show that, yeah. um, you know, between West and, and Southern Africa, you know, we really don't know enough about what's happening, you know, in these different countries. Do we know what the main exports are? Do we know yeah. what the languages are that they speak? To? What are the uh, socioeconomic issues that they have in these countries? So, I think that there's a lot more scope to be having conversations. You know, now with social media, it's so much easier to to find um, stringers, to find uh, people that can can add and enrich the stories that you're telling across different countries. Leanne de Basson-Pierre, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. She's speaking to us from West Africa. And uh, you may remember her. She used to work uh, quite a lot here in South Africa as well. Okay, Paula Frey, we're going to talk to you again after the break, taking a look at uh, the local newspapers. Stay with us. You're watching Media Monitor. Welcome back. You're watching Media Monitor. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we ran a story on the Jewish Report and a cartoon that appeared in its paper labelling a pro-Palestinian activist organisation as being anti-Semitic. In our report, we said that this followed uh, their front page article about a cartoon posted last October on the Facebook page of the SA Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions BDS Coalition. Well, we want to correct our report. The story wasn't on the front page of the Jewish report, but rather on page four of the November 11 edition. And of course, that makes quite a difference, doesn't it? Not the front page, it was a page four story, but the 
contents and the merits of the arguments uh, remain. The Jewish report uh, was forced to apologize to uh, the uh, BDS for calling them uh, anti-Semitic and uh, the Jewish report has taken the matter on appeal and we're still hoping to hear from the Jewish report their side of the story. They said they'd get back to us. It's time now for us uh, to go back into our news archives where we take you back to the 1st of January 2000. And uh, that's when we welcomed the new millennium. Yeah, do you remember that Y2K? That was a time when many of us thought the world would come to an end. Our computers would crash and nothing would be the same. Well, this is how the SABC covered the story. Countries across the world breathed a sigh of relief as they crossed into the new millennium with no reported Y2K problems, despite apocalyptic warnings by computer experts. Fears eased after one of the first major countries, New Zealand, passed the midnight deadline without any sign of major trouble. In the United States, only a handful of minor problems were experienced, which are under investigation. The world held its breath as New Zealand entered into the new millennium. But at 12 o'clock, traffic lights continued to work, cash machines were working too, as was everything else. It was a great relief for many. Countries in Europe, including Russia, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and now South America, have made the transition to the year 2000 with no report of significant Y2K issues in key infrastructure areas. Our indications are that major national infrastructure systems in those countries are functioning with minimal uh, or no difficulties. As monitors kept a watch over Russia's nuclear power plants, there was no sign of the Armageddon predicted by worried experts. Russia's creaky Soviet-era infrastructure and late start tackling Y2K issues made it one of the countries considered most at risk. Worries have focused on Russia's huge arsenal of nuclear warheads and aging power plants. Another potential problem case had been Japan. Tokyo had been accused of failing to prepare properly. Worries intensified after the nation's worst nuclear accident in September. But as midnight tick passed, nothing exploded, nothing crashed and nothing stopped working. It does look like the millennium bug was but an empty threat, but some faults may take time to emerge. South Africa has passed into the new millennium without a single Y2K-related problem, but there's still a long way to go. The full impact of the bug will only be known by June this year, but the government is confident there will be no major failures. Both the National Y2K Decision Support Centre and the M2K Operation Centre were manned from early yesterday morning. Operation centers throughout the country and the world were in constant contact, ensuring that each country was well aware of possible problems that could occur. The Y2K operation was the first time that the entire world had spoken to each other at the same time. In Pretoria, the National Municipal Y2K Operation Center received continuous reports from around the country. And at the stroke of midnight, engineers, technicians and programmers watched and waited for any reports of failures. 12 hours after the rollover, no failures had been reported. We have only received a few reports of disruption of some of these services, such as electricity, but those were because of weather conditions. Areas marked in red on this map have not yet reported to the op center, but the center has confirmed that operations are continuing normally. But this is just the first hurdle. When businesses open on Tuesday, there could still be failures. Y2K experts say that the real impact of the bug will only be known by June, as there could be hidden problems that will only surface later in the year. The op centers will monitor networks and systems on a 24-hour basis until the 5th of January, after which the operation will be scaled down. Prushain Palay, SABC, Pretoria. So that was Y2K. So don't panic when you hear about all these conspiracy theories. We survived Y2K. We can survive, survive 5G and everything else. Okay, let's uh, take a look at our local newspapers now. And uh, we have Paula Frey to talk to us, CEO of Frey Intermedia. Paula, I know that you want to look local and transcontinental as well. So let's start with the local story. Which paper and what story grabbed your attention? 
So it's been quite interesting today with, with the coverage of vaccines um, um, across the three major um, um, Sunday papers, the Sunday Times, the arrival of the vaccine, the um, the City Press, um, but but also the Sunday Independent um, um, with the headline of we don't want to be vaccine guinea pigs. Um, and I think that, that the real challenge, I suppose, for all of the media who are covering the vaccine is to get the science right and to make sure that ethically we're covering it as much as possible. But obviously, you know, for both City Press and for the Sunday Times, I think the stories that strike me, of course, are the um, the ESCOM stories, the the coverage of the um, of, of, of ESCOM, the ongoing coverage of ESCOM, um, and 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 really the City Press just highlighting the importance of investigative journalism in the work that we do. So some interesting stories there, mm. um, and worth looking at. Um, shall we go transcontinental? Yes, yes, um, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think one of the um, so so we were talking earlier on about just coverage on the continent, and um, and I would strongly recommend that that people really kind of look out for the continent um, um, newspaper. It's a online newspaper um, produced by the Mail and Guardian here in South Africa that you can get via um, um, S, um, via WhatsApp or via mm. email, and they they have a really interesting also um, um, covered story. They the cover story this week is on long cover from um, Nigeria, just highlighting the real need for, for Africa research around COVID-19. And then also a smaller story inside about what's happening with um, Tanzania around COVID. But what I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier on about coverage of the continent, what's really interesting about the continent um, publication is the variety of stories that they actually have. So they have a behind the scenes with a burner boy, um, um, a music video. They've got a deep dive <laughs> investigation. Yeah. Um, from the DRC um, um, there. So, so just a real mixture of, of stories um, um, from the continent in terms of countries, but also the format of the writing and then also the actual themes uh, um, of the content. Paula, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so, so much indeed. And thanks for pointing us uh, to that website because we really should be doing more African stories for sure. Thanks so much indeed. Chat to you again soon. Thank you very much, Peter. Great. That's uh, Paula Frey, CEO of Frey Intermedia. And that's where we come to the end of this week's edition of Media Monitor. Thanks so much indeed for uh, joining us. And please, COVID-19 is still with us. So please do all the things. Wash your hands, sanitize them, sanitize your surfaces, social distances, stay at home as much as you can. But please, more than anything, make sure you wear a mask. Bye-bye.